And when they came to a place called Calgatha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple, and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land into the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthahin, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly this was the son of God. Good afternoon, church. As we uh, gather here today, we gather to uh, celebrate Good Friday. And I think one of the temptations that we can face when we come into a Good Friday service is to feel like we have to celebrate it as if the resurrection hasn't happened. But just to be reminded, Jesus right now is risen, amen? amen. And so when we come to celebrate Good Friday, we don't celebrate it as if we don't know what is gonna happen. We're not like the disciples on the Saturday who, who weren't sure what was gonna occur, but we come knowing that as Jesus who was crucified and laid in the grave, he rose again on the third day. And so we come with a somberness because we, we see through reflecting on the crucifixion, the significance, the breadth, the, the enormity of the cost that it took for those of us who are lost to have a way to be reconciled back into a relationship with the loving and holy God. And so we, we are humbled by that, but in our humility, we are yet brought to a point of rejoicing because we remember that Jesus, in fact, did pay it all. And that because he has rescued us, we, we sing in celebration of the greatest love that's ever been demonstrated for us. And so uh, we are gathering here today humbled by the events of the cross, by Jesus Christ's sacrifice on our behalf, but yet ready to sing an immense celebration together that because of that, we can know him, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. We can experience eternal life in him, begin to know him and to walk with him and to love him. Our uh, service is gonna be a little bit different in, in the sense that there is no, there's not going to be a sermon from behind a pulpit. 
But instead, in this Good Friday service, the sermon is going to come from the pews, from each of you. Our service is going to center around taking a journey through some hymns of the cross where we've selected various hymns that all center around Good Friday, the crucifixion. The the first one that we're going to sing will center uh, and, and, and really cast our minds to the events. What is the narrative? What are the things that played out in this crucifixion? After that, we'll sing a couple hymns that declare what did those events accomplish? Like, what did it provide for us that would lead us to rejoice? After we sing those, then we'll, we'll sing a, a couple of older hymns to help us guide us in our celebration. Uh, through taking the Lord's Supper, the very uh, institution, the ordinance that Jesus gave us as a means of grace to continually celebrate in humility yet rejoicing what happened on that Good Friday. And then the last hymn we'll sing declares our response. In light of this love that we have received, how then should we live? How then should we worship? How then should we follow after this loving God. And so the the first hymn that we're going to sing is a hymn called uh, The Power of the the Cross. And it was written in 2005 by Stuart Townsend and and Keith Getty. And it paints a picture of that Good Friday when when Christ was tried and beaten and nailed to a cross, when he suffered and he died. And then the chorus declares the significance of it all, the power that was contained within those events. And my hope is I will um, is lead us through this time of seeing is that I would simply be a tour guide to help you sing with understanding. And as we move towards each hymn that you would declare as a means of worship and encouragement to each other that I would set you up to really fix your mind on the words that are about to come out of your mouth. And then as you sing with understanding that therefore uh, you would be pierced to the depths of your heart to understand and to know the love of God that has been poured out for you. And so in this first hymn, The Power of the Cross, in declaring the events, some of the words that we're going to declare are this. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. Oh, to see the pain of written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood-stained brow. But now the daylight flees, now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head. Curtain torn in two, dead are raised to life finished the victory cry. We stand forgiven at the cross. Let me pray, and then we will stand and sing together. Father, we come before you as your church, Christ as the head, as the suffering servant who paid the ultimate price for our salvation, who now has been raised and seated with you in the heavenly places, who reigns even now as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the head of the church. Would you help us all as your church gathers today to set aside those things that might distract the focus of of our minds and of our hearts and that would prevent us from meditating on your love poured out for us on Calvary, that would prevent us from worshiping you and ascribing to you the glory that is due your name to keep us from anything that would keep us from receiving from you the grace that you desire to extend to us as we do declare to you. Would you crush our pride? Would you help us to come before you in humility? And would you help us to sing as those who know the height and the width and the length and the, the depth of your love for us? Would the songs that we sing now and the meditations of our heart be pleasing in your heart, O God? We love you. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
Isaiah chapter 53, it says that all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And there's a reality of our life that every single one of us has wandered and strayed away from God. But then one came, God himself taking on flesh who never strayed, who walked in an obedience that we never could, and thereby himself in his person becoming an all-sufficient merit, who because of his perfection could both offer us a perfect righteousness to clothe us, to help us stand rightly and justified in the presence of God, and not only to be a perfect righteousness for us, but also be a perfect, unblemished sacrifice to pay all of our sins upon himself and to declare the accomplishment of those two things in the person of Christ. Let's sing all sufficient merit and Jesus paid it all.
darkness watching Find in me thine all Jesus made it all All to him my own Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow You can take a seat for a moment. I want to give you a few minutes just to think about the truths that have been declared, the things that we've contemplated on, that we've uh, worshipped and rejoiced in to God together, and just give you a few moments to really personalize it and to think about the fact that uh, the wounds that were pressed upon his head, the, the pain that he endured 
wasn't just for some nameless and faceless group of people, but it was for you. What he paid all of was not just the sins of a general people, but your sins specifically. All of your wandering, all the chastisement that you deserved was laid upon him. And yet, out of his love for you, he paid it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. It was for joy, the joy of your salvation and the glory of God, that he endured the suffering of the cross. So I just want to give you a few moments to silently reflect upon that. Not just in some general way, but what Jesus has done for you. And as the the truths of that seek into your mind and into your heart, to pray. And to praise God for who he is, to praise him for his love, and to thank him specifically for his love towards you. So take a few moments and do that now. with the thoughts of uh, what Jesus has done personally for you and as you look around this room and you see people that you know and you love who are a part of this church family and you remember that what Christ has done for you, he's also uh, does for them. I want to move this towards uh, the means that God has given us corporately to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf uh, which is the, the Lord's Supper. God gave us the Lord's Supper as a means of grace and we remember the work of Christ and we apply it to our individual lives and we apply it to the, the corporate body of Christ that it's something that he intends to stir up in us again joy in the gospel, a celebration of the love of Christ to remind her our union with him. It's also in a very real way as we gather here together, the, the living God is in our midst and as it's, it's a means of us in a, uh, in a manner enjoying communion with the living God as we eat this meal, as we celebrate this meal of the Lord's Supper together. Um, to prepare us for that as we pass the elements to each other, we're going to sing another hymn. And the hymn is based uh, off of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1, which I'm willing to bet that not many of you in this room have memorized. Okay, But here's what it says. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for impurity. In the year 1772, a guy named by the, uh, by the name of William Cowper, meditating on that specific verse, that in that day a fountain will be opened, wrote the hymn, 
There is a fountain filled with blood. This is how it begins. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath its flood lose all their guilty stains. It's beautiful, right? And there's a picture here that he's drawing out that it's through this fountain of love is represented by the blood of Christ poured out that all who would come to him could have their guilty stains of their sin removed. It's a song about the purifying work of Jesus Christ in our lives. And there's two particular aspects of this purification that this hymn draws our attentions to. It draws us to mind first that as sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. So the guilt of our, st- of our sin, the stain of that guilt is removed from us. But it's not just that Jesus removes the guilt of sin from us. He is also at work removing sin altogether from our lives. Amen? Jesus is sanctifying us. He is washing us by the water of his word. He is making us into a holy people of God. He is making us fit for heaven. And as he does that work in our lives today, he is preparing us for a day when it will be done completely. And when we come together to take the Lord's Supper, we're not just remembering that we're guilty no more, but that God is actively at work in your life, in my life, in the life of all those who are a part of the church to make us a more holy people. And as we experience that holiness that God is working into us, it's a means of our rejoicing because we experience the greater depth of life in knowing him. We experience the greater goodness of life in walking in all the ways that are pleasing to him, not just by matter of uh, obedience of our, of our works, but also in having the right knowledge of God and the right affections about who he is, loving him for who he is and loving that which he loves. And as we progressively grow in our Christian faith, the Lord's Supper continually reminds us that it is God who is at work in us. And so as we come around today, this meal that God left for us, that Christ has left for us, may it be something that encourages you of the ways that God is still at work in your life. That through his blood, he's not just removing the guilt of your sin, he's making you altogether new and holy and pleasing in his sight in such a way that would help you stand out and help us as a body stand out as lights in a dark world and giving us a message to proclaim of the goodness of who God is to the good of others and ultimately to the glory of his name. And so we're going to stand and we're going to sing this together as we pass the elements. I believe the trays are on the left side of every aisle. And so as we begin to stand and sing, um, if you'll just begin to pass those, take the elements out, but then hold on to them. And after we sing uh, this hymn together, we will also then uh, partake of the elements. So let's stand to sing and pass these to each other.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, it says this. For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ was broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ was shed for you. Take and drink. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for all these amazing graces that that we have been singing of. We ask God that as the the bread and the juice uh, linger in their taste in our mouth, that it would be a reminder of us not to, to move quickly beyond thinking about what you have done for us that in it we would see your justice, yet also your mercy and compassion, your grace and your love. And in doing so, you would capture our hearts anew. And that we would, in some significant way, recovenant our lives to you. That we would indeed be reminded of why we would deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow you. Would you help us to be a people who love to survey the wonders of the cross? And in doing so, we would have all of our boasting and all of our pride appropriately crushed. That you would bring us to a place of humble rejoicing. Because we know that the only thing that we've contributed to our salvation is a need for it. And that you have given us everything. You've given us everything in your son. So would you help us to rejoice in him? Amen. Let's sing again.
that last uh, verse demands my life, my all. Whenever we rightly consider what happened on Good Friday, the, the only response is to understand that what it calls for is us to give our lives fully back to Christ, to, to do for him whatever he would have us to do, to do for him whatever would glorify his name. I want to read you uh, some lyrics from the, the hymn that we're about to sing that will help us declare just that. Because of what God has done, therefore, he is all I have and all I will live for. Listen to this. It will ring back in your mind to this past Sunday of the lost sheep and the lost coin and to the following Sunday after Easter of the prodigal son. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way. The sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave. And I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hell-bound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so all might see. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. O oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose. And let my song forever be. My only boast is you. Hallelujah. All I have is Christ.
I'd like to end our time by singing the doxology. Let's bring this on, y'all. Y'all want to unplug and just come up here? We'll do it a cappella. And um, there we go. <laughs> to summarize what we've just sung and to, to look forward in our minds to the resurrection and what it means, I just want to read uh, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses, verses 1 through 10. This is our story for those who are in him. This is what we've received from him and him alone. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And then two amazing words show up. But God, amen? But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, what did he do? He made us alive together with Christ. For by grace we have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. It's already done. So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, we have been saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that none of us may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. Amen. What a blessing. Let's praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God. See you Sunday. Have a great day of worship.